on behalf of our program director, Ray Silverman, and me, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Nina Simon's talk this evening, the first lecture in a year-long lecture series entitled Reimagining Engagement, Emerging Opportunities for Museums and Audiences. The presenters in this year's series are individuals whose work addresses the legacy of several generations of computing and the rise of the internet on audiences and their museums. While early evidence of this impact may have been the, automated, the automation of museum collection management systems and the general flowering of museum websites, museum audiences, uh, museum, museum audiences experienced this shift in the ability to pull treasures from museums around the world directly onto laptops, laptops located on kitchen tables, in library cubicles, and coffee shops in their own worlds. Today, newer technologies such as iPods, iPhones, and social networking technologies have changed the game yet again, creating the expectation that museum goers will soon have the ability to customize a user-centered museum experience in much the same way that we now fully expect the ability to personalize our music, our information, and maintain our social relationships. So while not every speaker in the series will be focusing on issues related directly to technology, each will address some aspect of the new world in which museums and their audiences now find one another. It should be a very interesting year. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Nina Simon, exhibit designer, museum consultant, and recently published author. Nina Simon is an independent exhibition design consultant with Museum 2.0, a, a design firm that works with cultural institutions to develop innovative exhibitions, educational programs, and online projects, all of which aim to engage the audience as co-creators, not just observers. Some of Nina's recent clients include the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, the National Gallery of Art in Denmark, the Boston Children's Museum, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Nina's most recent publication is called The Participatory Museum. In this important book, Nina focuses on how museums can become more dynamic and relevant to the public at large by working with and engaging community members and visitors. Many of you will also know Nina as author of the very popular Museums 2.0 blog, a participatory blog that, uh, that explores the way uh, that Web 2.0 philosophies can be applied in museum design. Recently, the Smithsonian Magazine has called Nina Simon a visionary. I'm not sure what's left for Nina to do when she turns 30. The record of accomplishments she has already accrued in her 20s will certainly be hard to top. Nina Simon's appearance at the University of Michigan has been arranged by the Museum Studies Program and is co-sponsored by the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And now please join me in welcoming Nina Simon to the University of Michigan. Great. Uh, I'm going to start with a highly unprofessional thing and change a slide. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and then open it up to discussion. I feel like I should have a big tattoo right here that says, ask me anything. I'm really open to anything you want to talk about um, and have lots of examples and stories I'm happy to share with you. So rather than spend my time guessing what those things might be, I'm going to talk for just a little while and then we'll see where we want to go. Um, I want to start by being really upfront. I have been working in museums since I was in college. I'm obsessed with them, but I'm mostly obsessed with them because I'm very frustrated by them. And I think that there is huge potential for museums, for libraries, for cultural institutions, for art centers uh, that's unfulfilled. Um, when I think about what excites me about a museum or a science center or a library, a lot of those things are reflected in the mission statements of those institutions, but the experience that people have coming in the door 
isn't necessarily connected to that. Um, and so I feel like, um, I feel very strongly that museums need to change, not to become something different from what they say they want to be, but to find better strategies to live up to the things we say we want to do, particularly as they relate to civic engagement, uh, social involvement, and dynamic experiences around culture. Um, and for me, the core change that I want to talk about has to do with this, that traditionally museums are visitor agnostic places. They don't care if you're a 10-year-old or you have a PhD, they're giving the same experience to every person who comes through the door. And I think that when we think about how museums need to change or what they can be, um, to me the core idea is to look at how can we become more visitor-centered. Um, frankly, this is something libraries do much better than museums, looking at every individual that comes in the door and saying, ah, what is the thing that you need or what is the thing you're looking to do here today and really customizing that experience. But it's not just about personalizing or customizing. It's also about thinking about what are the needs that are out there that people might not be able to articulate coming in, but that we can fulfill in really exciting ways. When I think about this switch to being, from being focused on content to being focused on visitors, it comes with a couple of other switches as well. Um, traditionally, I think of museums as destinations. Museums are typically places where people um, historically go three times in their life. You go as a, st a student, you go as a parent, and you go as a grandparent. Um, I'm much more interested in museums as places for everyday use. I have a librarian friend who once said to me, you know, people use the library, but they visit museums. And it drives me nuts to see people um, choosing to frequent a coffee shop every day or go to a bar every week, but that we'd never think, oh, I want to visit that art, or a very, very small percentage of us think that. Um, the second thing that I think needs to shift is the focus on a core value of museums as trusted sources of authoritative content. I think that that continues to be something that museums um, can do, will do very well, but I don't think it's a value proposition from a business perspective that we can hang our hats on anymore. I don't know anybody who's sitting around on a Sunday evening and says, gosh, who painted that you know, portrait of the woman with the babies? And then the other person says, to him, oh, I know, let's wait until Tuesday when the museum's open and we'll go and we'll find out. No, of course, we now trade off the opportunity to have the trusted authoritative source with the source that's immediate and potentially unvetted. And we've all learned to be more sophisticated about how we manage information. And so while I think that still maintaining being a trusted source is important, I'm more interested in the value proposition of museums as hosts for social experiences. Uh, I think there's a real stress in museums about why people are going to come to the place. Some people argue that it's about seeing the real thing. Some people argue that it's about being in the company of objects. And I think that um, con it continues to be true that people are looking for physical places that can put them in an environment to have a particular kind of social experience. When visitors are surveyed about why they go to museums, it doesn't really matter the type of museum. Always in the top three is to have a good social experience, whether that's with my family, where I'm sharing a learning experience with my kids, whether it's when people come from out of town, whether it's on a date. Um, frankly, I have a personal dream that museums will be seen as the hot pickup spot for people who are into culture and art and science. Um, I, I don't see a reason why we shouldn't be looking at museums as a host for a particular kind of a social experience, which is very different than the kind of social experience you can get in a bar or you can get in a coffee shop. Um, finally, museums have historically really been places that are about a consumer experience. And I uh, believe strongly that they should continue to be so, but that we need to also look at how we can add in the idea of museums as a place for making and sharing. That it's not just a place for you to consume what's there, for, but for you to be part of it as well. Um, I think science centers have historically, and children's museums have done this really well. You know, when you walk in a science center, you immediately get this message very strong. You can be a scientist, try science, be part of this thing. But I almost never go into a history or an art museum where I get that same feeling of, you can be an artist or engage in historical research. Um, I worked for a long time at the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. And um, people always used to say to me, oh, it's easy for you to get people to play in and participate here um, because espionage is so sexy. 
And it's true, I agree, espionage is sexy. But frankly, I can't think of a job more sexy than being an artist. And I think that we really miss out when we don't make that connection for people and say, you're not just here to learn how to be a connoisseur of art. You're here to learn what it's like to live a creative life, to pursue something um, to no end, you know, to breathe in paint fumes all day. Um, and that kind of experience and connecting to being a creative agent or being a researcher, if it's something like a history institution, is something I'm really interested in exploring. Now, um, I'm not just interested in these things personally. I think from a business perspective, it's absolutely necessary. And as museums are trying to become more relevant places, um, it frankly pisses me off to see that groups like this knitting stitch and bitch group choose to pay their money to a coffee shop to go and knit together instead of doing that in an art museum. Um, comparably, something like this is a hacker space, a place where adults get together and do science stuff. And this one is in Providence in a kind of gallery slash bar. Um, I'm very interested in and hang out with a lot of people in sort of the maker hacker space. And when I talk to folks about, hey, why don't you do this at the local science center? It literally does not occur to them as a location for this kind of activity. And meanwhile, on the other side, I have people from science centers saying, my god, how can we get people in their 20s and 30s to come to this place? Um, and you know, it's not just about saying, hey, we do science experiments here too at the science center. There are a lot of things that a hackerspace offers that right now, frankly, museums can't offer. It offers a place where you can go late at night, where there can be loud music and drinking while you're doing an activity, uh, where there can be messiness, where if you get really involved, you can help plan the program, where if you get incredibly involved, you can have a key and show up and use the space whenever you want. This sense of being part of a place, of being a co-owner, um, is something that I think we really need to start to embrace if we want to connect with people who are really committed to the kind of content we produce. Present. And for me, um, from sort of a theoretical perspective, this comes down to a juxtaposition of two different models of being. Um, in a traditional museum, the goal is really to provide consistent content. And the measure of a great museum is one that performs high quality information, but really in a consistent way. So again, it doesn't matter if you're 10 or if you have a PhD, you're getting the same labels. You know, when I worked at the Spy Museum, it is a fabulous example of this kind of museum in that we were providing great consumer experiences for every person. And as soon as you walked away from an interactive, it immediately reset for the next person. A million people could come through in a year, and you would not know that there was, you know, besides the cleaning that was going on in the middle of the night, you would not know about anything about the people who had touched it before you, the people who had come through before you. We were all um, providing and having great consumer experiences. Um, and so what I'm more interested in now is this kind of place, a participatory institution that is able to incorporate the experience and expertise that every visitor brings in the door, as well as their particular interests. And to say, hey, you're really interested in ancient Chinese pottery. This is the space for you. Or hey, your grandmother worked in that mill. We want that story. And we have a way that it works into our workflow to integrate it into our exhibit. It's a lot messier to work on that right side uh, diagram than it is to be on the left. But I think that the opportunities that come with it in terms of being able to create relevant, exciting, dynamic experiences for people are really worth it. This is not just about providing new value for people by creating something that's more personally relevant or something that's active and really changing and sexy. It's also just about providing better learning experiences in the ways that museums have always tried to do. You know, we constantly are in this conflict. Should we write labels at a fifth grade level? Should we write them at an eighth grade level? Should we write them at a you know, college level? And there's this sense that we have to pick one, because otherwise we're going to clutter the room too much. And I'm really interested in, no, how do we find a way to be able to deliver to each person the content that's going to be of most use to them? And how do we find a way for them to be able to tell us in midstream, ah, this isn't working for me, or I want this, or that other person has something I want, and be able to set up those systems? Um, you know, When Brad gave the introduction, he was talking a lot about the web, and um, I'm very inspired by a lot of what goes on in Web 2.0. I very rarely work in technology these days, because I think museums are doing a great job of embracing that on the web. And I think that now we need to start taking some of those models into what happens in our physical space. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, the guy who's coined largely with the ter in coining the term Web 2.0, um, most simply defined it as software that gets better the more people use it. 
And that's a really interesting idea. It basically, you know, if you think about something like Google, every time you type something in, when you click on responses, it gets better based on which ones you chose. It changes how it prioritizes things. And I think we often think about the participatory web just in terms of, oh, people can upload stuff, they can share stuff, they can talk about things. But it's also that that's a really responsive space. And every time you favorite something on YouTube, it changes which videos it's going to recommend to you. Every time you comment on a um, photo on Flickr, you don't have to worry about that comment going into a black hole of a suggestion box somewhere for some staff member to check it, say it's OK, and then put it up on the website. It goes there, you see it, and other people can respond. And I think comparably, when we think about how do we make a museum that gets better the more people use it, we have to think about how do we design these platforms that allow people to share what they're doing. Um, now, I do not want to dwell in the abstract because I am fundamentally a very practical sort of do-it person. Um, I have an engineering background, and we were talking about that earlier today, and I, I really feel like um, being trained as an engineer means that I don't see problems and want to sit around and talk about them. I see problems, and I want to try and make experiments, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, so what I want to do with the rest of this time is just briefly show you some examples of ways to accomplish some of these goals. So the first is around making places for everyday use. And for me, this fundamentally comes down to this juxtaposition, that instead of focusing on making these big halls and these fancy buildings, we should be trying to create places that feel like a place where everybody knows your name. I realize this is probably the youngest group I've ever spoken to and used this um, with. Um, sometimes I can just put this up here and expect everybody to sing, but um, I wasn't <laughs> confident with you. Um, so, But I think that one of the challenges, frankly, that small museums have is that they try and be like the big guys instead of embracing the ability to be more personal. You know, if you only have 15,000 people coming through your door every year, you have an opportunity to have a relationship with most of them in a way that I will never have with the Smithsonian or with the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and so when we think about personalizing, and we think about this idea that museums say, oh, we want to have relationships with visitors. We want to foster relationships. Well, in our personal lives, we have some basic standards for what constitutes fostering a relationship. You know, if we've gone on a date and we see each other again, you expect me to remember your name, you know, maybe some other key things I've learned about you. Um, but so many times with museums, they're sort of like terrible one-night standards, right? You come to a museum, you have this great experience, yeah, I'm building my relationship, and then when you come back, uh, the person at the front has no idea who you are. And so I think that we need to think about, OK, if we say we're going to build relationships with people, what does that mean about how we're going to acknowledge them, how we're going to validate them, and how we're going to grow with them instead of it just being about you can continue to come back here and pay us money? Um, so examples of how you can do this. This is a picture of a wall in a coffee shop in London called Tina, We Salute You. Um, you know those punch cards you get at a coffee shop uh, to say that you've, you, know, you get 10 coffees and then you get one for free? Well, in this coffee shop instead, they have this wall. And when you buy coffee, you can put your name on the wall. And each time you buy a coffee, you can put another star around your name. And when you get to 10 stars, you get a free coffee. You can see that you also move from black to red. And people who are total caffeine addicts like Gina B then go to outlining their reds in black. Um, so you can continue to build up lots of coffees in this way. Now, what does this do? It acknowledges the fact that the cafe is saying, OK, we don't know everybody's name. We are not going to know everybody's drink coming in here. But we have a sincere interest in you being part of this place and in supporting you continuing to come back here. And we have such a sincere interest in it, we're going to give some real estate to you. And you can write on our wall and own part of our space in this way. Now, it also does kind of a brilliant thing in terms of promoting sales, which is when you first get your name on the wall, it's kind of depressing that you don't have any stars by your name. And you would really like to come back and get more stars. I realize not everybody's motivated by this get more stars kind of thing, but um, for some of us, it's very appealing. Um, I think also it just. Um, demonstrates to visitors or to patrons that there are other people who come here a lot and maybe you could be like them. You know, one of the things museum people constantly say to me is, we just want people to come back. And then I ask them, OK, do you tell them that, that you would like them to come back? Um, do you have some way of saying to them when they leave, 
you know, as one guy who owns a restaurant where I live in Santa Cruz says, see you tomorrow, which is ridiculous. I'm not going to come back and have sushi tomorrow, but he's expressing his interest in me doing so. That's what these cards do, too. When you get a punch card, it's suggesting to you there might be a good reason for you to come back. And this may sound ridiculous. You may think, well, of course visitors know that we're going to have new exhibitions and that they would like to come back. But a lot of visitors, especially first-time visitors, don't know that. And they've been bred in a pattern of, oh, I go on a school visit. Why would I come back here? Um, or even libraries, I think there's the same sense that, OK, I got my card. What do I new do now? And at least at libraries, you're forced to come back. So you have this continual interaction of, and now something else, and now something else. So thinking about how do we promote that to help move towards habits of more everyday use. Um, this is an image from the Oakland Museum of California. They just reopened um, with a really radical reinstallation. This is the State Museum of California. This is a piece from an exhibition about the baby boom. And they decided that instead of getting stock photos or putting up stats on the wall, they would do what is, in fact, a huge wall. And they would invite people from their community to bring in their own baby pictures from the 1950s. So this is a very simple exhibit. It's just a whole bunch of pictures on the wall. There are lots of ways they could have done this with historical record. But instead, they said, hey, we want to make this a community thing. And as it turns out, unsurprisingly, people come in. They point out people they know. They say, oh, you know, this is my mom, or whatever it is. And there's just this little sense that, hey, I'm part of this museum. Um, this is my favorite story on, on this topic, and then we'll leave it. Uh, this is a picture from a museum called the Worcester City Gallery and Museum. Uh, please come in and sit down. Um, uh, it is a very small museum, and it's in a town, um, a very small town in England. And last summer, they wanted to do an exhibition that would get people coming to the museum multiple times and talking about art. So they did something that to anybody from an art museum in this audience will not sound like it would accomplish this goal. They um, did an exhibition called Top 40 Worcester's Favorite Pictures from the Collection. They took 40 paintings out of their permanent collection, and they hung them on the wall. But what they also did is in the middle of the room, they put out paper ballot boxes. And they allowed or invited people to vote for paintings to go higher in the top 40 countdown next week. Um, and you could explain your reason. You could say, I like it because it's pretty. You could make an art historical argument. It didn't matter. On Friday nights, they would open up the box. And they would take these large labels um, and move them around the room. So this one says nine in the countdown of favorite pictures. You can actually see that this number label is bigger than the object label. Um, the woman who ran this project told me she knew it was working when on Saturday mornings there were people lined up outside the museum to come in and see how the numbers had changed. And they had lots of people who would come back again and again and would stand by their paintings and sort of advocate and hawk them, say, oh, don't you think this one? And people would bring in their grandparents. And there was this real sense of excitement around it. Now, when I first heard this story, um, I misattributed the success of it to the voting. I thought, oh, this works because it's fun to vote and let people do this interesting activity around the art. But I've since started to really feel that what made this successful is the responsiveness of the institution. That the institution didn't just say, we care what you think. It said, we care what you think, and we are going to change what we are doing every week based on it. Um, it's that idea of you know, the museum that gets better the more people use it. If you come back and vote again, you can have more impact. If you get your friends to come in, you can have more impact. A lot of times when we invite people to participate, it's sort of a black hole experience where they're able to put something in. We say, thank you very much. And it's unclear to them when something is going to happen because of that, if ever. In this case, there was this sense that the museum is changing on an ongoing basis and is in a continuing conversation with visitors about the value relatively of these artworks. OK. Uh, next piece, looking at hosts for social experiences. Um, I think uh, this concept often gets a bad rap because it sounds like it's just about having a party at the museum. I, I'm actually pretty in favor of late night events at museums that get people there, even if they're not necessarily engaging with the stuff, um, just getting them using and thinking about the space in a different way. But that's actually not what I'm most interested in around this. I think what I'm most interested in is the way that artifacts can create opportunities for conversations and social experiences that otherwise would never happen. 
Uh, this is an image from the Science Museum of Minnesota's exhibition, Race, Are We So Different? Uh, it's an exhibition about the anthropology and science uh, of race. It's a fabulous exhibit. Um, and this object is a very provocative object. It's actually two objects. It's two stacks of um, money, real money, showing the income disparity among um, or between races in the United States. So this big stack um, is whites, and next to it you can see a much smaller stack for blacks. Um, this object is the kind of object that provokes a conversation that otherwise does not happen in our daily life and frankly doesn't happen in, unless you're really engaged in a very particular object of study or of work. Um, and when I think about what's exciting to me about looking at artifacts as hubs for social experience, it's that opportunity to triangulate a conversation through an object in a safe way. Um, as an example, uh, I have a tattoo, and when I got this tattoo, I had no idea that I was entering a secret society of people with tattoos and people who like to talk about tattoos. People come up to me all the time to ask me about the tattoo. They touch my arm. Um, we have these conversations. They show me their tattoos. And it's all possible because we're talking about these objects that are not explicitly about each other. People do the same thing with dogs and with babies, right? You talk about the dog, you're sort of looking at the dog, but you're talking to the person, and there's a sense that through this object, it's now safe to have this social interaction. And comparably, I'm really interested in, okay, how do we make artifacts into dogs or tattoos? How do we make them locuses of a social experience? Um, this is a kind of radical example of ways to play with this. I teach a graduate class and the museology program at University of Washington. And last year, I uh, challenged a group of students to design an exhibition that would get strangers talking to each other. They designed an exhibit called Advice. Um, it was in kind of this weird little room in the student center at UW. And these are just a couple of examples of ways they got people giving and getting advice. Uh, on the left, we have a, a post-it wall where people could post questions and then answer each other's. Um, so what's the best way to cure a hangover? Ginger ale and french fries, drink more. You know, we, we didn't uh, vet this advice. Um, this actually was a redesign. The uh, original thing we had planned was that the staff or the students had made signs with questions for people to give advice on, and people could write post-it answers. This is kind of a typical museum thing. The museum puts up a question, people can answer it. And we found that those were kind of stale. And when somebody started doing this, we found that people were really into doing this, giving and getting advice from each other. Um, we had this sort of core question, though. You know, Would you put up a question and then come back to this place to see if somebody had answered it? And we found that, yes, people did come back. People wrote things down in their notebooks. And they were very engaged. Um, but to me, the most exciting part of this exhibit is actually this image on the right. Um, this is, as you can tell, an, a free advice booth. Um, this advice booth was not staffed by the students who ran the exhibit. It was set up in a way that anybody could come and just decide, I want to sit in the advice booth. You, you could sign up if you wanted to, but you could also sort of do it emergently. Um, next to this woman, I, I've never used this laser pointer. Is this good? Yeah, OK, so next to this woman, um, there's a sign here, a whiteboard that says areas of my expertise, so people could change what they were you know, ready to give advice in. Um, this was very popular, and we had all kinds of people giving advice. We had an eight-year-old who came back twice, and and um, he was a very popular advice giver, and I couldn't really figure out what the deal was. And so I came over once and was listening in, and um, this uh, college student had come up and said to him, you know, I've been having some problems with my boyfriend. Our relationship's gotten a little stale. Uh, what should I do? And he looked at her and he said, you should do something you've never done before, like stay up all night and eat candy. And uh, you know, that was pretty good advice. Um, what I'm really interested in about this project, and this is sort of the engineer side of me, is the design um, or, or the necessity of the $50 we spent on plywood to build this booth to making this work. There are a lot of museums that are trying to set up um, centers for conversation or for dialogue, and they get fabulous couches and coffee tables, and they arrange them together, and people don't use them to talk about what people want them to talk about. Um, as a, a great example of this, uh, this is from a project, actually a friend of mine worked on um, in North Carolina at the Levine Museum of the New South. This is an exhibition about cross-cultural uh, engagement, and they have this area that's sort of like a park that's a graphic behind the bench, and there are all these benches with signs and different languages that say talk to strangers. 
Nobody ever sits on these benches. And um, when I was talking to the designer about this problem of nobody sitting on these benches, um, you know, I brought up to her that I think the graphic sort of has the answer to this in it, which is, especially if you're a female, I think you know that if you sit on a park bench and a stranger comes up and sits on a park bench, it is not like an exciting, positive social experience. Um, and I think that it's really important when we think about designing and being a safe host for a social experience that we think about what are those designs metaphors that are going to make people feel confident and comfortable about doing this. And I think what worked so well about the advice booth was people saw it and they immediately thought of some kind of peanuts thing and they thought, oh, this is fun. I can do this. I'm going to get some advice. Or yeah, I want to give somebody some advice. Um, whereas this kind of thing or a couch kind of thing with some kind of prompt um, can make people feel unsure about, oh, do I, eh, is this part of me? Is this not? Um, interestingly, in this exhibit, there's another area with a picnic table. Uh, with no big talk to stranger sign or anything, which is a very successful place for strangers engaging with each other, because there's something about that design metaphor of being around a table that feels much more comfortable for that kind of engagement. Uh, my favorite project of this type is called Human Library. It's happened all over the world. It started out as a youth festival project in Europe. Um, a human Library is an event. It can be staged at a library, at a museum, at a festival. And how it works is this. Um, they have books, but the books are not books. They're people who represent certain stereotypes. And so if you as a visitor come up and you want to be a reader, um, a librarian will be there and they'll say hi, and they'll say, here's our catalog. And you flip through the catalog, and they'll have things in it like transsexual, Iraqi veteran, uh, traffic cop. And you can say, oh, I'd like to check out the paraplegic. And they say, great. And a person rolls out and um, then spends 30 minutes talking with you. Um, this is a quote from a, a woman who uh, went to the first uh, living li sorry, human library that was um, done in Istanbul. She um, checked out a gay book, and she said, I've never had a gay friend. It was unbelievably exciting to find myself facing him with his body, opinions, and identity. It seems he was not very different from me, and especially he was not an alien. From now on, I will not disrupt my communication with gays. I will enhance it. This is a project that's been um, performed and evaluated all over the world with incredibly transformative results. And the reason I get so excited about it um, is, again, you know, like the advice booth, but in a much more profound way, they've taken a metaphor to really make something possible. You know, they don't need a library metaphor to do what they're doing. You know, they could say, come meet your stereotype or something like that. But there's something about using that ritual and that convention, you know, writing out, making a library card, um, looking through the catalog, interacting with a facilitator, that sets up this expectation for people of a safe place to encounter and learn from difficult and challenging new ideas. And I think the reason this project inspires me so much is because ultimately I'm not that interested in creating social experiences that just help people find people who are like them or things that they'll like. What I'm really interested in, and frankly what I think a lot of museum folks are interested in, is inviting people to experience and to connect with new ideas that might be challenging to them, that might encourage them to change their mind or to confront something that's a long-held belief. And I think that if we're going to try and do that, we have to find those forms and those design metaphors that help people feel comfortable and ready to embrace that. OK, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is making and sharing. Um, there are so many ways that visitors can participate in museums. Uh, just a very few examples. Uh, at an art center, uh, an exhibition about questions where people were invited right in the entry to write up their own questions about art. Great. Um, middle Top, this is from the Chicago Children's Museum. This is an exhibition, an interactive thing called Skyscraper. Uh, it's in an exhibition called Skyline. It's called Skyscraper Challenge. Your family builds a skyscraper together. As you do that, there is a camera that's facing you that takes an automatic photo every 30 seconds. When you're done making your skyscraper, you turn to this little computer kiosk, and it, it's all in audio with pictures. Remember, F Children's Museum, lots of little kids. And it says things like, um, pick a picture from a time when you solved a tough problem. And it shows you the bank of the automatic photos that were taken, and you pick one, and then you tell a little story in audio about it. Um, and you do this successively, and you create a little multimedia piece about your experience. 
There are a lot of projects in museums where they're inviting people to make something digitally, which then gets emailed home or they can check back on the web. And frankly, the um, take up rates on actually going back to that website are dismal. Most museums where you're invited to save things or um, even to take a photo of yourself, the percentage of people who choose to revisit is in the, the single digits. Um, this project, and this project, remember, if you go to a children's museum, you have little kids with you. you are, they are running around. Um, you know, it, there is a lot going on. This project required people to go to the web. It was not something they emailed home. So you had to go on the web and type things. Um, and uh, somewhere in the 40% of people choose to go back and engage with that. Now, in some ways, that um, has to do with the fact that the commitment is front-loaded. It takes about 15 minutes to build your skyscraper and do this whole talking thing while you're there. So people who don't want to do that um, don't end up getting to the end of the process. But it's also true that people have made something that really matters. Um, they're not just doing something, dashing it off, and getting out of there. Um, bottom middle, this is another picture from the race exhibition from Science Museum of Minnesota. Um, when this exhibition first opened, I was looking at a bunch of photos of the opening with the director of exhibits there, Paul Martin, and we we're noticing that there are a lot of pictures with people pointing in them. And we were talking about this idea that pointiness is a kind of measure of how much people want to share what they're looking at. That you, know, you don't point at something on your own, you're pointing it out to somebody else. And so when I think about making or participating, it doesn't have to be that you're putting your question on the wall or you're making your multimedia piece. It can be just that you are sharing something in real time with somebody else. Uh, and finally, on the right, one of my favorite uh, forms of participation. Uh, this is participation to solve a problem. This is from the Minnesota History Center. They give out buttons to people to show that they've paid. And um, they had this problem, which was people were throwing the buttons all over the place in the parking lot, on the exit, things like that. So they put up this very simple kiosk that just says, thank you for visiting. What's your favorite exhibit? Place your button in a bin to vote. And then they have the six, five exhibits that are on display at any time. So people, instead of throwing them away, put them in these bins. Um, is this a great data collection research project? No. Is it allowing visitors to contribute very creative content or commentary on their experience? No. But it's turning something that was a problem and a frustration into an opportunity for visitors to give a little bit of feedback, for the museum to learn a little bit, and for there to be this sense, again, that the museum is listening and is interested. And so because there are so many ways to participate, far more than there are on this slide, I think the hard thing for an institution is to figure out what techniques are going to work for us. You know, OK, we want to be participatory. We want to do this stuff. What does that mean for us? Um, and so I want to share just one example for you. Um, and this is not from a museum. It's from a library. Um, this is the mission of the New York Public Library. I actually think that if you're interested in mission statements, you should go on their website and look at theirs, because it's really well done. It's not just this sentence. Under this sentence, they break out each one of these little things that they do, and they say, and here's how we do this. And um, I think that's really important to have an actionable, you know, evaluatable mission statement if you want to do interesting things. So OK, their three things they want to do are inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, and strengthen our communities. OK. So here's a story I want to tell you. Um, this is Jessica. Um, Jessica was a desk librarian, actually, when I first um, uh, started hearing about this story. She's now in the rare books department in New York Public Library. Um, and Jessica um, was a desk librarian who had regular desk librarian functions. She also taught a class in what's called bibliographic instruction, which sounded like Greek to me, but she explained, no, no, it's just how to use the library. So you know, every other Sunday, she would have anywhere from three to eight people show up to learn about how to use the catalogs, what was in the different um, rooms, how to get different things from the um, facility, that kind of thing. Um, so you know she's doing her job, um, and along comes this guy, uh, Josh, who came to work at the library. Um, and Josh was hired as this director of digital strategy and scholarship. And he looked at the mission, and he sort of said, OK, um, what can we do online to really invite people um, to engage with us? And what can we do to really enhance our mission to inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, and strengthen communities? And the way he started was by looking around and realizing, gosh, we have all these people here who work at the library who are really smart and are really passionate about specific things. And we're going to start with what he called unleashing the experts. We're going to do a bunch of experiments where we invite people within the library who are jazzed about something to create a project around it. 
So Jessica was one of the people um, who got excited about this opportunity. Um, Jessica has a personal interest in crafting, and she, as a librarian, spends a lot of her personal time looking in the collection at cool stuff, um, historical stuff, um, instructional stuff around crafting. So she started a blog uh, called Handmade, and basically she finds things from the collection um, and that she's interested in and shares them with other people. Um, so for example, here's a post about um, a 1941 wardrobe survey of um, what women were buying in terms of clothes, and um, she was just you know, sharing, here's this collection thing, and um, here's some of the comments people are sharing about this, talking about um, why they sew, talking about the money and the math of this post. Um, you, it's cut off, but the person at the bottom is somebody who actually went to college in 1941, so you have this additional personal perspective on this. So you're encouraging people um, to think about the library as a place for lifelong learning. They're advancing knowledge with each other, and there's this little community growing. Then Jessica thought, okay, I want to do more. Um, and she partnered with an outside uh, video blogger um, to create um, this series called Design by the Book. Um, this is a fabulous video series where they invited local New York artists to come to the library, engage with the collection, and make artworks based on their experience at the library. Uh, I really recommend you that. Um, here are some of the uh, comments on YouTube um, from this uh, series. Um, people talking about how they're excited about what this program can do to bring people back to the library. I'm inspired. Um, the second person saying, a great library or any library is a natural place to refresh and feed the creative force. Um, I like this third one the most. This person is nervous because there's only going to be one more episode and saying you have to do a full show. Um, and this person also says, we need films like these to give us the chance to see other creative souls in action, reading interviews gets boring. Um, so for at least this person, this kind of mechanism of the distribution of the content um, was something that was going to be really more appealing than other kinds. And again, you're getting the sense that the library is not just saying it's inspiring lifelong learning, they're really trying to do something to pull that out. Um, now, the last thing Jessica did, and I mean, she's still doing this stuff, this is not like a story in a box, um, is she went back to those classes she was taking, teaching in bibliographic instruction. And she thought, gosh, is there a way that I could be doing these um, and bringing in the same kind of excitement that I'm getting out of these other things I'm doing? And so she started this monthly program called Crafternoons. Uh, Crafternoons is a program in bibliographic instruction and crafts. So you come to the library, um, there's an artist there, you make something, and you make something with um, bibliographic, um, sorry, with collections materials from the library. So for example, um, this was a time when they did punch card embroidery. So you know, you put holes in cardstock and then you like sew between the soles, the holes. Um, and so in this case, these people, or this person, has made this elephant punch card based on, I think, this 1930s um, uh, um, sort of children's art book. Um, and so what Jessica has found is, first of all, instead of three to eight people, she's getting 50 to 100 people coming to the library. She's getting people who are coming in and saying, wow, you know, can I do research on 1920s cloche hats here? Or can you help me find materials related to this thing that I'm really interested in? Um, she's also had a huge diversification of audience. Um, she's had a person come in who said, um, I never knew I could come into this building before. And this is the New York Central Library with the Lions. You know, when we talk often about how do we bring in underrepresented audiences? How do we connect with people who don't understand what, they're, what we're about? And this kind of project is really building that bridge in an exciting way. And when I heard this whole story from Jessica, the thing that kind of shocked me the most was that um, she does this with no money from the library, but she does get some of her own, her time is covered for doing this. But everything is volunteer. The video um, partnership with the outside person is volunteer. The craft materials um, come in from people who are coming to the program or um, ones that come in as donations. And I asked her, you know, why does your boss let you take time off from being a desk librarian, which is a very hour-specific, location-bound job, um, to do this. And she um, was talking about rare books, and she said, you know, rare books um, are not just rare for their content, they're rare in how they're made. And so my boss really understands this connection between handicraft and the books we have in the rare book library. 
But I think Jessica's really not giving enough credit to herself and her boss, because I think what they really understand is the connection between all these projects and the mission of the library. People ask me a lot, um, how can you start doing a risky project? And I think that this is the core answer, is you look at your mission statement, and you try and figure out what is a way that we could really accomplish this goal, or we could really try and accomplish this goal, and get away from what are the things we've always done, and get towards what is a way that I'm excited about that we could really make this happen. And when you can use that sentence, when you can say to somebody, if we do x, it will help us um, be able to deliver on why part of our mission, that is a sentence you can take all the way to the top of your institution with power. And I think at any level of a museum or a library or an art center, being able to connect not just to, oh, visitors will think this is cool, or we've got to do this because everybody's doing this, but being able to say, hey, this will make us better at what we say we're about. Again, when I think about how I want museums to change, that's what I want them to do. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, again, really ask me anything. I'm happy to show you examples of whatever. Um, yeah. Yes? Uh, I have a couple of questions that I hope are interrelated. Uh, I'm just really excited, and I'm sorry I missed the workshop. So if, I, if I'm hitting something that's already been covered. Um, first, I, I wanted to pick up on something, something you were talking about in, in characterizing how to make people feel welcome and how to make them feel like they can come back when that's what we want. Um, seems to me there are, there are two ways to sort of um, have people feel comfortable in a space, um, any kind of space. One is to be explicitly invited and sort of mm -hmm. urged or like, mm -hmm. you know, come, no, really, come on, sit yeah. down, it's fine. And another one is for that person to like have overcome an obstacle to get there in the first place. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like the people who love New York because mm -hmm. they've lived there and struggled to like mm -hmm. figure out where stuff is and how to use public transportation and now they own it. And I. I guess um, a lot of people who are already really invested in museums, I think, and I hope I'm not putting words into mouths of people here, um, became invested in museums because they were the latter kind of person, right? Because you, you have memories of your great temple institution and you roaming around there as a kid or as a young adult feeling like, no, you've got to see this painting. It's in this room mm -hmm. I know about, mm -hmm. right? You're on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the one hand, I wonder about um, models like this and like what Elaine Gurian also brings to the table as sort of excluding the core community of museum goers. And most of that is just a little bit of sure. Brave New World kind of anxiety, yeah, probably yeah. Nothing, nothing too serious. But, but then the second question is um, even stuff like this that seems really simple and amazing like the, the craft projects, aren't you just emailing the list of people who are on your email list already? And, and how do you bring in brand new audiences without just making sure that it's, I mean, it's people who know someone who already did the wayfinding in the mm -hmm. museum community mm -hmm. to begin mm -hmm. with. Sure. Okay, end okay. of monologue. Okay. okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so on the thing about core audiences versus new, uh, this is something that always comes up. Even if I, in my wildest dreams, and I'm not even sure, I don't think I would want to do this, but if I could snap my finger and make every museum become more participatory, then you can get worried. But the reality is that a very small percentage of museums um, are going to devote a small percentage of what they do um, to doing these kinds of things. And frankly, those traditional visitors have the whole rest of the place and the whole rest of the world of museums to be happy in. Um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, I um, so I play beach volleyball and I play in these tournaments called No Attitudes Allowed tournaments. And the guy who runs the tournament always in the beginning says, "If you want to hit it over on two or you want to yell at the other team, go to the CBVA. They've got tournaments for you." You know, there are other options for people who want a different kind of experience. Um, I think also that traditional museum visitors have um, a lot more resources at their disposal to find those other options. And so, you know, if you're a big museum that a lot of public are coming in, um, you have an opportunity to connect with people in a way that um, a very small museum might only be known to aficionados and connoisseurs. So. Don't get too worried yet for those uh, people. And I think also um, any museum has lots of different kinds of experiences for different people already. And this is just sort of adding more tools to the toolbox in that way. 
Um, do you want to come before I go on? Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure that I understood completely, but I, so I think it's related. We'll see. So like since UMA opened, so I work here, and since UMA opened, we've probably done 15 to 20 projects of, that have something in common with that mm -hmm. crafting group. Mm -hmm. And my question is, you are often working with a constituent group, and that constituent group may have a very um, altered sense yeah. of the museum. Sure. But how does that, how does that accrete mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. fundamentally begin to shift the picture mm -hmm. for those people that are not directly experiencing those experiments? That's a great question. Um, there's actually, uh, there's a guy named Peter Lynette who writes a blog that I really like. Um, he's a museum arts and uh, university researcher. And he did a piece recently about uh, what he called parallel versus pipeline experiences. And that traditionally when we think about bringing in new audiences, we think about it's going to be a pipeline. We're going to offer some things to them, but the goal is to get them into the core thing. Um, whereas another alternative is to say, this other audience is important to us, and we're going to create a parallel set of experiences. And we don't expect them to show up for the, the core stuff that we do, because we know that that's orthogonal or, or barely related to their experience. Um, so I think that most places have to make a decision at some point. And it's really uncomfortable for museums to make audience pr prioritization um, decisions, because it means you're saying no to somebody, and museums are supposed to be for everybody. But um, I think that at some point, you have to decide, hey, this audience is so important that we're going to do X for them as part of our core. So for example, at the Oakland Museum, they piloted and now have formalized what they call loud hours, which are hours when the gallery is explicitly, they say, we want you to be loud, um, to talk, to laugh, to whatever in the galleries. And that came from a real goal around reaching teen audiences. And because of their pilots, they felt like, even though this frustrates some of our core audience, um, we're not going to treat it like a parallel experience anymore. We're integrating it into our core of what we do every day. And it's happening during hours that are more likely to be hours those people will show up. I, I do think that um you know, every museum, every um, institution has the experience of, oh, we, we brought in this artist, or we brought in this exhibition, and that brought a particular group of people in with it. You know, when Science Museum Minnesota hosted race, they had a huge increase in African American visitorship, which did not sustain when their next big temporary exhibition came in. Um, but they did start to look at, okay, what are things that those visitors, who we are excited about, expect in a place that they perceive to be welcoming, that they perceive to be a good experience, and how are we matching or not matching for them? And so I think that there are museums that make some real choices in that regard. Um, one of those, the San Jose Children's Discovery Museum, um, they have done a lot of outreach with both um, uh, Mexican and now Vietnamese families. And they had huge success um, integrating and bringing in uh, Mexican families by doing some programming that was specific to um, cultural celebrations, by doing uh, new language um, support, and by just you know uh, marketing in those neighborhoods. When they took that same technique and tried to apply it with Vietnamese families, they totally failed. And what they found was, in talking to Vietnamese parents, that what the Vietnamese parents in that community valued as family time was very different from what the museum offered. So they heard things like um, competitive events for our kids are important. You know, we want our kids um, to be in talent shows and to be um, in competitive exhibitions, and that's something that the museum was really not about. They also heard, um, you know, martial arts are important to us, and you are really against fighting, and you know, it's a part of our culture, and we find this offensive. So um, that museum is trying to decide: well, do we really want to be for Vietnamese families? And if so, are we willing to change some of our core values um, to support the kind of things that they consider to be good family experiences? I think that's a really hard question to answer, but that they have to be realistic about the impact that how they decide will have on which audiences feel excited to be there. I noticed that most of your examples were from situations in which the, the differences among audience members and potential audience members uh, are more along what I would call n neutral lines, so differences in interests and exposure and things like that. I was wondering if you had any specific examples or methodologies of museums or approaches that deal particularly well with, with more difficult knowledge, so knowledge coming out of painful, um, divisive histories, um, things that 
that presents to, to very different constituencies, perhaps contested versions of the past, things that are very unevenly painful for people based on their own experiences? Sure. Well, and actually, in history institutions, thank you uh, for that question. Um, uh, history institutions, in some ways, I've seen embrace participation more readily than other kinds of museums because there is a uh, sort of an anthropological shift towards um, valuing multiple perspectives in a history museum. So there now, I think, is really strongly the sense that there is no single story of the Enola Gay. There is no one label about it. We need to find a way to invite people's different voices and perspectives on this in. I think that um, museums get most concerned around issues of authenticity and um, of people attributing to the museum um, emotional uh, contributions that are made by visitors. Frankly, I don't think that's really realistic. I think that people are savvy enough to know the difference between a professional label on a wall and a visitor comment. But um, I think that the challenge of what you're describing is the difference in power and comfort of different people who might want to participate or be involved with something like that. And um, I'm working on a project right now to build an exhibition based on Half the Sky, which is this Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wu book about gross human rights violations against women in developing countries. And um, so we are presenting stories of sexual violence, of um, you know huge amounts of um, maternal um, illness and death, and really rough stuff. And and when we talk about participation around it, um, we focus more on how do we create an emotional safe space for people um, and less on how do we let people share everything they want to share. I think that, frankly, it takes a lot of trust for somebody to feel comfortable sharing something that's emotional or um, really tough for them with an anonymous um, audience. And I think that what can be more important is to say, how do we set up a space that supports for those who want it, a place to sort of be in an emotional safe space, to maybe talk with some other people, um, maybe to involve themselves in a collaborative art making piece. Um, I do a lot of those kinds of projects where maybe you don't want to talk or write about it, but maybe you want to be part of making some big weaving, so you want to feel like you can do something. One thing also that often comes up in museums when they're presenting rough content is visitors say, um, if there's a political opportunity, they say, I want to do something. What can I do? I do some work with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a mission that is very activist. And that partly came out of conversations with visitors where visitors were saying, I don't just want to look at the pretty fish. I want to save them too. What can I do? Don't tell me I can look it up later because you're an impartial institution. What can I do right now? And they've done more and more projects in civic engagement where, you know, whether it's letter writing campaigns or whether it's you know actions that you can take um, and those have been very successful and so I've seen a lot of museums move into civic action from that I haven't seen a lot of museums find ways to invite spontaneous emotional sharing um, I, I think that that is fraught in a lot of ways uh, let me tell you a short anecdote about that um, I was at the Ontario Science Center working with their floor staff and uh, security guards and um, we were talking about what their social goals for the museum are and um, we challenged them all day than to go out and try and make one of those goals happen. So for example, one group said, you know, uh, the Ontario Science Center should feel like a family. And so we talked about, OK, what are things that you do with people who are members of your family? Well, one of the things is that you touch each other. And so they said, OK, we're going to go out in the museum, and we're going to try and like high five and handshake and hug visit. We're going to try and get them to do that with us. That one went great. Here's the one that didn't go great, was um, the people who decided this is a place to explore challenging topics. And they went up to a group of teenagers, uh, this was two staff members, and they said, um, what do you fear most? And this one girl said, suicide. And they said, oh. And then she said, yeah, I've been thinking about committing suicide. Now, um, they had a very bungled conversation with her, and they came out of that experience feeling like, holy shit, if we're going to ask that question and get that kind of answer, we need some other kind of training. And I think that you know, it takes a lot to be in a place where you're ready to have that conversation and have it be productive. And some museums may choose to go there. It's going to take a lot of training and scaffolding and support for that to happen, I think. Nina, to uh, follow up on your last comment, um, in thinking about the people who work in museums yeah. and looking at your paradigm shift from yeah. the traditional to the participatory, how would you characterize the shifts that are needed in terms of 
professional staff. What is the role of the new curator, for instance, sure. in, in this context? Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's not that different for people who've been educators or for people who've um, been really great floor staff in terms of what their goals are and what they're trying to do. It is different for people who've traditionally been in a role that had a lot of authority, like a curator. Um, granted, most museums have moved to a team-based model where you know, curators are not solely ruling the, the roost in terms of how things are put up or, or what's written. Um, but I do think that they're the people who are most threatened or feel most threatened um, from an authority perspective. And um, I like to really separate expertise from power in these kinds of conversations. And I think that, in fact, there are many ways to continue to be an expert without continuing to have all the power. And you know, for me, newspapers are a key example. When you look on the web at a newspaper article, the comments on newspaper articles are often totally crazy, you know, if you've ever, I mean, and yet nobody gets confused about who wrote the article and who wrote the crazy comments. It's very clear, people are savvy about that. Um, and I think that comparably, you know, we live in a democracy and the idea that we have these institutions where there's only one voice that can tell you what's going on um, is frankly kind of ridiculous. And it's actually not even reflective of how museums really work in terms of how visitors use them and the crazy things visitors say to each other about what's on display. Um, but when it comes to training, I think that, um, I think frankly a lot of people I meet, whether they're already in an education or visitor service capacity or whether they're young and getting into the field, are very excited about this stuff. I think it does start from having a people-centered focus instead of an object-centered focus. Um, that said, there are a lot of collections people for whom, who are using participatory techniques in really creative ways, you know, to source information about objects that they don't know a lot about, um, to invite people to create artworks or do research based on objects that are in the collection. So I think um, you know, the core values that somebody has to have to be successful in this way are um, generosity, a sense that visitors are there to do good and not evil, um, and, um, and a sense that there's a real potential to make the museum better with them rather than just for them. And I think, for me, this is like my constant design question on any project. How can visitors make this project better? How can they make this exhibit better? How can they make this program better? Not what fun thing can we give them to do, but how can they help me make this thing better? And I think when you get generous about that and start thinking about, I don't have all the answers. All these people can help me. Um, you know, That's a skill that anybody in any position can have. Um, and it's just about an institution supporting it. I want to get your opinion um, on a specific problem. Uh -huh. um, I, I work at the American Museum of Magic. Uh -huh. um, we, um, we're not a very kid-friendly museum. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the history of magic and magicians, um, but when people see the word, they expect to see, when they see the word magic, they expect to see magic. Tricks, yeah. um, it is a performance art. Mm -hmm. um, we have magicians on our board. Um, we don't have, being one of the few staff, we're not, I'm not trained to perform mm -hmm. magic. And so uh, the magicians that are on the board want to have sort of a, you know, a high, they want to pursue magic as an art. So when they come in, people come in, they want to see a, you know, th they want the people to experience a, a good performance of magic. Um, so we have that problem with actually showing magic. The other problem that we have is, of course, when you say the word magic, everybody says, well, how is that done? Mm -hmm. And we also have a policy against revealing secrets. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there are men and women uh, still out there earning a living performing uh, these tricks. Sure. And they wouldn't be very happy with us if we were telling the whole world how those things were done. Right. So it's something that we talk about quite a bit, but yet we haven't uh, uh, come up with an answer on those things. I'm just kind of. I'm so un unsurprisingly, thoughts. the Spy Museum has a common um, issue with, with that second part. Um, you know, I think that uh I think that that second thing is something you can really work to your advantage. And you know, I'm thinking about people like Penn and Teller, where the whole show is about we're showing you how this works, but actually there's a bigger deception going on that you have no idea. And you know, and then there's the wow. So I think that there are ways to play that. I think with the first issue about wanting to make sure, or board members wanting to make sure that the experience is what they perceive to be high quality, that is a problem that is not exclusive to magic museums. And frankly. Um, it's your opportunity and responsibility to help those board members see that visitors 
who are not professionals like them have a different perspective on what magic is and need a different way in. And you know, I think this is a problem in any institution. The people who work there love the stuff, know the stuff, are already excited about it, and they want to provide experiences, frankly, for people like them. And we always have to remember, not everybody's <laughs> like each other. And um, you know, I could imagine, for example, in a magic museum, that it would make total sense to have little stations where kids could learn and play with very simple like cup and ball games. Uh, you know, and they will probably do those tricks terribly, but they'll be doing them with and for their family and the other little kids who they're with. And it's an introduction to magic and what is it like to try and do this. And gee, isn't this much harder than I thought? And, and am I getting an appreciation for the craft of doing this? I think you know, comparably, uh, when I heard about um, these guys uh, visit their first visit to your museum and how they got this tour from a curator who was integrating performance into the tour, um, that sounds like an incredible experience and one where if you can develop it and, and train people in it, you could really be a leader in providing a very standout programmatic experience in that regard. So I think that there's a way to balance, but to some extent, um, the museum is not for the board members. The board members are there to help you figure out how to make the museum for other people. And it's not always easy, especially if they're the ones writing the checks. Um, but I think that when you can start showing success and saying, all these school kids came here, and they now have an appreciation for the complexity of what it, makes to, what it takes to make magic. Or you know, we've had families come in, and they've said, now I'm really going to seek out an opportunity to do x or to see x. And when you can start presenting outcomes that excite your board, then they'll start changing their perspective on what they think is permissible. Um, I'm very big on outcome first. You know, if you say, here's how we want visitors to feel, then you pursue techniques that will make that happen, as opposed to saying, here's what we're OK with doing, and we'll just see what happens and how visitors respond to it. I hope that sort of helps. I think within the professional museum community as it exists, there's great interest in becoming participatory museums. And the people that attended the session this afternoon had genuine interest in how to bring this to mm -hmm. their museums. Mm -hmm. That said, I, I think that this is a trickier to do um, than we think that it might be, uh, and that there are points of resistance along the way that prevents it from happening overnight. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about the either the nature of the resistance uh, or why this isn't so um, quickly uh, achieved? Hmm. Um, OK, uh, let's see. So on the quickly achieved side, uh, I actually, you know, I've been shocked at, you know, why am I here on this stage? Because three and a half years ago, I started a blog as a personal research project, and it blew up into something that a lot of people in this field care about. Uh, that's obviously not the only reason, and I'm not the only person who's presenting these kinds of ideas. But from my perspective, this has been very fast, and um, there's been a surprising uh, reaction. Now, in terms of actually doing it, I think that museums are not uh, traditionally set up to do things in small little experimental tests and that that's what it takes to try things that are scary. Um, when I work with museums, we often, in just a couple of days, can do a number of experimental things where people, within just the course of a few hours, spend some time talking with visitors in a new way and they come out and think, oh, that wasn't so bad. Nobody died. OK, you know, we can try this again. Um, there, uh, there was a... Uh, series on Slate.com of interviews with people, big famous people about failure, you know, people who've climbed Everest, uh, you know, Anthony Bourdain, chefs, things like that. And the guy who's the head of Google Research um, was interviewed in, in part of it. And one of the things he said that I thought was really interesting was he kept emphasizing the scale of what risk means and failure means to Google. And he said, you know, I used to work for NASA in quality control. And if the space shuttle blows up, that is a huge issue. That endangers people's lives. So we really mitigated risk to be able to be safe. But if you click on a link from a Google result and it is not what you wanted, nobody dies. And so we can take risks and feel OK about the fact that you may, in real time, have a slightly diminished experience while we are doing that experiment. And so I think that comparably, um, we have to feel comfortable with the fact that when we do experiments, you know, when visitors can write labels for a day, 
nobody is going to crash. And, um, and we have to start looking at how do we start doing those kinds of light experiments. And what I've found is really just doing a few of those can start a culture going um, that can be very exciting. Um, one of the women I think is most amazing in this way is this woman at the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science named Beck Tench, who was brought in as sort of a technology person, but has done a whole lot of innovation projects across the museum. Uh, and she keeps a failure portfolio. So, and she really, with staff, does all kinds of things to sort of support, let's come up with more crazy ideas, let's try this, okay, you know, why didn't this work? And um, really trying, as sort of a one-person band, to get people feeling comfortable culturally with taking risks. Um, I think that people are much more nervous about doing new things than they need to be. As you pointed out, with something like this workshop, or when I talk to people, you know, it's not just young people in shitty jobs who like this stuff. There are museum directors, there are people in high places who are trying to make these things happen. And a lot of it is just self-censorship and fear that we can't do it. But I, I think, you know, take a risk, try and experiment. Um, that's what I would say to that. Um, I work in libraries, and one of the uh, very similar situations that we deal with is how to take a professional who has built their entire life on curatorial discretion and get them to lower that bar right. when the public is allowed to participate in it because it's such a different metric. Sure. And I think that uh, one of the real challenges for museums and libraries is that when they think participation, what jumps to mind is the newspaper comment thread. Uh -huh. You know, the sort of worst case scenario of what happens. Right. And as a result, they feel that if they allow the, the, the bar of quality to be lowered that far that the, the organization loses its entire meaning, why don't we just close up and open a coffee shop, et cetera, et cetera. Right. 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 So how do you help people who, you know, may be on board with the goals yeah. of getting new audiences in or engaging them in new ways, get past that point of feeling that they're selling their soul by letting people write whatever they want, right. or that they're risking the financial wherewithal of the entire organization because someone might write something really nasty and then someone influential might see it. Okay, um, so I'm gonna actually pull up some slides related to this. I've done a lot of community co-created exhibit projects, which scare the heck out of people for some reasonable, uh, I need to get out of this and go here. Okay, this is one of like the core lessons I've learned about design um, of participatory experiences. Um, this, I was at the Auckland Museum uh, in New Zealand and the director was walking around with me and she said, see Nina, when we invite people to participate, this is what they do. This is not adding value to anybody's experience. And she's right. Um, but uh, also, when I look at this book, um, this, as far as I can guess, is a wedding, uh, you know, I came to your wedding book. Date, name, and address, comments. It makes no sense as an exhibit response thing. Um, comparably, you know, on the web, we have these design environments for comments that are, you know, very uh, unscaffolded, undesigned. Um, okay, so in contrast, this is the best, um, uh, comment station I've ever seen in a museum. It was for the State uh, Museum in Lowell in, uh, sorry, the, it's a national park in Lowell um, in Massachusetts. They had an exhibition of Jack Kerouac's manuscript of On the Road. So they designed this thing, right? It um, has a typewriter, which is actually donated by the Kerouac family. It has a chair, a desk. It sort of creates this whole environment. And then they have this quote from Kerouac, never say a commonplace thing. And the comments people made on this thing are totally incredible. Um, this first one, uh, Dear Jack, Thanks for being there that rainy night in Greenwich Village at my basement apartment on Charles Street next to the fire station with Howard Hart and Bill Godden and Stella in her fur coat to keep out the November cold and bringing the bottle of scotch, which I shouldn't have been keep drinking, but I did anyway, even though I was nine months pregnant and about to deliver on the day of another John's assassination in Texas and the terrible days that followed for the whole country and for me, for leaving one I loved the most but was too scared to bring home just yet. Corinne. I mean, this is like an incredible comment. It adds to my experience as a visitor to this exhibit. And it works because the museum took the time to think about how do we design an environment that's in keeping with the emotional interaction people have with this object? How do we value their participation in a way that they're actually going to make something good? So I think there are a lot of ways with design to cultivate that. Um, from that advice um, exhibit, um, we had this thing called the bathroom wall in it. And even without even being able to read, you can see the difference in what people did in these different spaces. We had zero off-topic comments on the post-it board. And I think the bathroom wall had a big thing to do with that. You know, when you only provide one way for people to comment or participate, 
they're going to use it to do whatever they want to say. You know, your bathroom sucks, your food sucks, whatever it is. And then people feel like, oh, this is off topic. This is not related. When you give people lots of ways, uh, they shape up. Um, OK, but now back to your other, I think I have this in here somewhere. Back to your other statement. Um, I think that, uh, do I have those guys? Maybe not. I don't need them. Um, here's the analogy I use when I'm talking to people who are freaked out about this. In, in the way you describe. Um, I compare it, um, you're working with amateurs. They are non-professionals. They do not have your expertise. It is your job as the professional um, to help them um, and to be the expert consultant, facilitator, whatever you want to call it. And um, the metaphor I always use is cooking with children. You know, it is never faster, it is never easier to cook with children than without them, but there are reasons that we cook with children, right? You do it for a learning experience, you do it for a social experience, they feel the value of being co-owner of what's made, and in the end, you still get the cake. And I think that often people, um, when participation is sold as visitors will do work for us, um, there's a sense that, well, it causes us more work to help them do the work. Yeah, that's how cooking with children works, too. And there are reasons we do it. And so I think that for those people, um, and that goes back to the job question, it is a job shift to say, you're not going to be the exhibit designer anymore. You're going to help people who are non-professionals um, design an exhibit. But you know, when I got over that and said, it doesn't need to be my idea, you know, there's always this um, thing I think that people say sort of disparagingly, which is, um, oh, everybody's got a great idea for an exhibit. Um, and the implication is, but we're not, you know, but you know, that's immaterial to what we do here. And my way of taking that is, everybody has a great idea for the exhibit, so let me focus on the thing that I'm a professional at, which is turning those great ideas into good exhibits, instead of saying, I get to have the idea and I get to make the exhibit. So that is a job shift, and I'm not sure, there are gonna be some people who you can't sell on no longer getting to get the great idea, but I think that when they start thinking about, oh, you know, these poor visitors, they are like children, they need me, you know? Uh, they are going to learn how venerable my job is. Uh, I once met a curator um, who's the most enthusiastic about this I've ever met, and her reason for her enthusiasm was she said, uh, my collection is undervalued at this institution, and if I can find people out on the web or out in my community who are excited about it, it will raise um, my profile, make my work within this institution matter more. And that was a really, um, interesting and smart way to say, how can visitors make this project better? How can they make my job better? So I think we have one last uh, question in the back. Oh, maybe in the one over here. OK, go ahead. First, uh, I came late, so I'm sorry if I'm wasting your time with this question. That's OK. But um, I'm a trained librarian and archivist, and I'm in the museum studies program here. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you ended your talk by giving an example of uh, you know taken from a library context. Mm -hmm. I'm really passionate and interested about the convergence of libraries, archives, and museums. Uh, last year, I was in a project where we surveyed um, various archival repositories across the United States and um, measuring the economic impact of archives in states and you know municipalities and local government units so that they could have data to show that they contribute to the economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the fascinating things that we discovered in, the, in that study is that people from out of state or out of town, when they visit an archival institution, they also visit museums, libraries, mm -hmm. cemeteries, and other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. quote unquote heritage attractions. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, in my head is that there's definitely this kind of clustering and correlation between these institutions. And I wonder how you know, we could learn from each other because I know that we tend to have this attitude that we are serving different constituencies and how we serve them are also like sure. different in many ways. So I wonder how you could do that, you know, casting a wider net among heritage institutions yeah. within you know, different communities. Yeah, and, and you know, my, my uh, attitude about this is steal from everywhere, you know? It's not just libraries, archives, museums, it's theme parks, it's coffee shops, it's bars, it's whatever. Um, I think that, you know, what I get excited about and what I encourage more people to participate in is the conversation that's happening online um, around these kinds of things. Because frankly, you know, I know Eli um, that way and, 
it is immaterial to me that he's a librarian and I'm not um, for my interest in the fact that he does cool shit and you know that's what I'm looking for and so I think that there is an opportunity that maybe doesn't come up at things like conferences where people are self-aggregated with people who are like them um, that can really happen in, in those spaces um, you know when I started the Museum 2.0 blog in 2006 a year or two later, I said, oh, it was right place, right time. You know, this was just an early stage in the museum blogosphere. Um, librarians are way ahead of us, but museums have not moved that far since 2006 in that regard. And there's a lot of space online for people to be sharing links to interesting things from other places, to be looking broadly at what's going on. Um, and frankly, um, you can have a big impact quickly in this space because there are people who are searching for that information and it's not readily available in a consistent, high quality way. So um, if any of you are interested in this stuff, I really encourage you, start producing, start sharing, and people will listen and get involved. I think we have one last question slash thought over here. Um, so I am a student at the, mu at, the, at the museum, the School of Art and Design um, here at Michigan. And I find that while I'm there, a lot of what the students are saying is they want to just make. And maybe going to a museum isn't necessarily sure. their top priority. Right. What I noticed about myself is that I was more attracted to the public programs mm -hmm. that museums offered um, throughout the year, most of the time at night, mm -hmm. same thing. What I was really interested about is you're coming from a different background, from like an engineering background, sure. and how, how exactly do you think or do you think that coming from a different perspective and working with these institutions and museums makes a difference. I mean, obviously it does, but like how much of it is it just trying to show them a different way or how much of it is actually working with people who have been trained in different fields to create this common goal of a participatory museum? You know, the reason I got into museums was because I um, believe um, pretty strongly in alternatives to formal education. And so I don't tend to, uh, what excites me about working in them is working with people from all kinds of backgrounds. And um, I don't think of myself in it as any kind of an outsider in that way. I think what does help me a lot in a way I am an outsider is something that relates to what you were saying, which is I'm not a person who grew up loving museums. And I don't walk into museums and feel like, oh, this is the best place ever. In fact, I kind of feel that way about libraries. And it's a reason I think I wouldn't be good at working in libraries. Because I feel like, even as I work with tons of museums, um, I feel like I can be more of a visitor ad advocate or a kind of a reality check in terms of saying, hey, it's not just about what we love in here. It's about whether this works for people or not. And whenever you get really into something, it is much harder for you to be realistic about that kind of stuff. And so um, I think that that outsiderness helps. And it's tr something I try and continue to cultivate. You know, I learn a lot from visiting museums with people who've never been to museums. And I like to do that frequently. I learn a lot from going to places that make me feel uncomfortable and seeing, you know, gosh, what makes this place welcoming to that person but not to me? Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think that's an important, and I feel like, I don't know, it's something I've been relearning every day since I was in third grade, which is everybody thinks differently. And I feel like, at least for me, I don't know if I'm thick or something, but it's really hard for me to internalize that lesson, and I'm constantly re-remembering it. And I feel like when it comes to being generous, you know what I said before with visitors, it's about really being generous towards people who think differently from you and, um, and being open to the fact that they could teach you something too. And um, you know, for me, that core attitude, I think, um, is, is a focus that's sort of driven the kind of things that I do. Um, so thank you all for coming and missing Glee. And um, I do have some books in the back if um, you'd like to buy one, and then I don't have to take them home. And uh, yeah, I hope this has been uh, useful for you.